Have you ever had someone bring up the topic of race and diversity within a personal or a professional setting? And you know how you start to get that, that heart flutter? You start to wonder, what it, am I gonna have to defend myself for my friends? What is, it, what is it that this person is about to say? What are their opinions on race and diversity? Is this person racist? Did they vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> These are the sorts of thoughts that flow through our minds when the topic of race and diversity is brought up, whether it be in a personal or professional setting. And can I get a show of hands from anyone that gets a bit uncomfortable when talking about race or diversity? whether it be personal or in a professional setting. And it's totally fine, like, you can get the hands up. Like, I also have a confession. I, too, get pretty uncomfortable when talking about race or diversity, whether it be a personal or a professional setting, in all honesty. And, you know, I start to wonder those what ifs. Like, what if I have to defend my right to exist within the tech industry to this person that I'm talking to? And I say all of that to say this. If the topic of talking about race and diversity makes you uncomfortable, as someone once told me, please get comfortable being uncomfortable, at least for the duration of this talk. My name is Byron Woodfork. I've been in the software industry for about three years now, developing software professionally for just over two years. And in that time, I've learned a lot about the tech industry. And you might be asking yourself, who is this guy? How did he get up here? <laughs> and to answer that question, I essentially have to explain where I came from in order to explain how it is that I got up here to be speaking in front of you at my favorite software developer conference of all time, Strange Loop. I'm from Chicago, born and raised. And while this picture might be an area of Chicago that a lot of people are familiar with, this wasn't the Chicago that I was most familiar with growing up. The Chicago that I was most familiar with growing up was a little further south of where this picture was taken. <laughs> the Chicago that I was most familiar with growing up is where the original Regal Theater was built on 79th Street. The Chicago that I was from growing up is where we would go outside after school to play basketball and football at Eckersall Park and Jesse Owens Park. The Chicago that I was most familiar with growing up was the Chicago where communities would come together and band together to actually combat the violence that would happen within their streets and their neighborhoods on a daily basis. And because of where we lived, if you know my mom, my mom was a bit overprotective. <laughs> my mom always looked for ways to keep us confined inside the house and keep us entertained. She didn't really want us going outside too often, and for obvious reasons, we were on the south side of Chicago after all. And as a result, my mom purchased us my first computer when I was about 12 years old. And if anyone remembers this beast, this compact Presario desktop. <laughs> this was my mom's way of keeping us in the house more often. And I remember the day she brought it home. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about it. I wanted to learn the ins and outs. I wanted to break it down. I wanted to put it back together. I wanted to learn about the software that ran on this thing. So I'd use it every day after school whenever I could. And at the time, we couldn't really afford the internet. So huge shout out to AOL for, <laughs> for providing these disks. They would drop these off at our mailbox, and these things were like gold to me. Like, people would toss them away, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, give me those. <laughs> like, I can use as many of those as I can. I got free internet. You know, so, uh, but fast forward a few more years, I found myself in high school and towards the back end of my quote unquote career in high school, and I had this hobby in tech, and I just wasn't quite sure what exactly to do with that hobby, right? And, I wasn't sure how to translate that into going into a professional field whatsoever. Uh, so because of that, I pretty much looked around and I was like, hey, what's everyone else doing post high school? And some of my friends were going to college, so I said, heck, why not? I'll give this college thing a try, see how it goes. Uh, and college was a bit of a blur. I don't remember a whole lot about what it was that I was taught when I was actually in college, unfortunately. And because of that, the inevitable happened. I actually ended up dropping out of college uh, due to a lack of interest as well as lack of funds. Uh, and I wanted to, and I knew at the time that I dropped out that I wanted to pursue a career in the tech industry. I just honestly had no idea how to go about it. And where does every college dropout go who wants to break into the tech industry. 
Any? Uh, uh, you guessed it, Best Buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, right? <laughs> So I worked here for like a year or two, and one day I came to the realization that this wasn't the place where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. I realized this <laughs> So with that realization, I began my journey to break into the tech industry. I began researching tech careers, and I landed on the career of a software developer. And I remember thinking to myself, Back in the day, I used to be really good at designing MySpace layouts, so becoming a software developer should be pretty easy, <laughs> right? Uh, so I started learning via different websites such as Code Academy, W3 Schools, and eventually I realized this was going to be much harder than I thought it was going to be originally. So I began reaching out to friends to see if there was anyone that I knew that knew someone that was in the tech industry, if I knew someone that was in the tech industry and that was a software developer. And I completely forgot in talking to one of my friends in passing that he had told me that he was a software developer. You know how you ask someone what they do for a living and it goes one ear and out the other and that's exactly how our conversation took place. Uh, but anyway, so my buddy Dave and I, uh, we chatted for a while. I was asking him questions about software development and what it meant to be a software developer. And in doing so, I was looking for resources. And I noticed something. Dave, as I kept asking these questions, Dave kept answering. And I was like, if he's going to keep answering my questions, I'm going to keep asking them. And eventually, Dave realized that I wasn't going away. So he invited me out to a software development meetup at a, a company known as Eighth Light. And he had told me, if you want to learn about software development, we have open meetups Fridays at my company uh, at Eighth Light in Chicago. So I was like, cool. So I came out to Eighth Light, and this was my first time experiencing a software development meetup. I had no clue these things existed, so my mind was kind of blown at the time. And after the meetup, Dave and I talked, and he asked me if I'd be interested in going through an apprenticeship with him as my mentor, whereas he was going to help teach me software development. And I was like, okay, Byron, play it cool. Like, <laughs> don't, don't let them know exactly what's going through your mind. Don't let them know that you're desperate to leave your job at Best Buy. <laughs> right? So I, I put on my poker face and I was like, sure, I'll, I'll do this software apprenticeship thing. Uh, so, and to explain what apprenticeship is, uh, if you want to become a professional software developer for the company known as Eighth Flight, uh, everyone has to go through some form of apprenticeship. And it looks different from, uh, for people with different levels of experience, and it also looks different from when I started. When I started, there was student, resident, and then you would become a professional dev, and that's pretty much how things were at the time. And of course, my first thought was, all right, Dave, like, how much is this going to cost? And that's when Dave informed me that a flight was going to pay me to learn about software development. And I was like, um... Okay, sure, that's, that sounds kind of sketchy, but I'm down for it. I'm like, Dave's my buddy, I trust him. Like, I, I'm really high for this apprenticeship, so he could, could have told me whatever, and I would have believed him. <laughs> so, and I remember going home to my parents, and I was like, hey, mom, hey, dad, I'm about to quit my job at Best Buy and like, pursue this software development thing and become an apprentice at this company, and at the end of my apprenticeship, I might get a job as a software developer. And my parents didn't exactly echo my same exact sentiments in excitement. <laughs> like, and, like at the time when I like went to tell them, like they were like, yeah, no, keep your day job. And you would have thought that I came home and I said, hey mom, hey dad, I'm about to pursue my career as a rapper and I'm gonna drop one of the most fire mixtapes you ever heard. <laughs> Right? And uh, you have to understand, my family doesn't come from a technical background, nor do they come from a college background. So they knew what they knew, and they wanted, to, wanted me to go with something they were more comfortable and more informed on. Right? Like, my dad was a military man, so he wanted me to join the military. My mom was like, hey, you become a doctor, because, you know, why not? They make a whole lot of money. <laughs> you know, so in, in short, that's how I became a software developer. And in going through my apprenticeship, it was easily one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life, but it was equally rewarding. And sometime around the time that I had finished my apprenticeship, I remember I was having a discussion with a colleague, and we were talking about race relations within the country. And during our discussion, my colleague asked me, 
He said, why aren't more black people successful like yourself? And they're wondering, like, right, like, you grew up in a not so great neighborhood, like, you made something of yourself, like, why aren't more people like you doing the same? And I had to explain to my colleague that there were a lot of people that I grew up, th grew up with that simply had things of which, or that I had, I had things of which a lot of people that I grew up with simply did not. And w after that conversation with my colleague, that helped lead to the inspiration for this talk. After our conversation, I wanted to pinpoint exactly what it was that I had that helped me succeed so that hopefully I could help others like me achieve some sliver of success in the tech industry as well. And as a result, I asked myself this question, where is the gap for minorities in the tech industry and how can I help close it? Similar to my colleague, many people wonder why minorities aren't succeeding at their respective companies. People wonder what's preventing us from breaking that barrier that exists between us and the tech industry. And once we're here, what's preventing us from becoming software developers or becoming team leads or becoming executives within our respective companies? And in asking myself this question, I realized where one of the biggest turning points came for me personally and how I was able to achieve some sliver of success in the tech industry. I realized the solution to breaking the barrier for minorities in tech is providing a strong network of mentors to support them. And now you might be thinking to yourself, well, my company hired minorities and they still left, or my company hired minorities and they were unhappy, or my company hired minorities and they were unable to climb up the corporate ladder. And there's a number of reasons for that, and we're gonna touch on one of those reasons today. For years, our industry has been mentoring everyone the same as the next person. For years, our industry has been doing instructional mentoring without conforming to the, to the needs of the unique individuals in which we're mentoring. For years, we've been duct typing our junior level developers, expecting to get the same results that we got from everyone else. <clears throat> and while duct typing may be a concept that we regularly use in software development, you simply cannot duct type people. We can't, ex we can't expect everyone to conform to the same exact type of mentoring <clears throat> and a huge contributing factor as to why you'll get minorities that leave their respective companies is due to the fact that you're mentoring them the same as you've mentored everyone else in previous years. And if you haven't noticed, I look different from a lot of people in the software development industry. And because of that, I guarantee you, you and I have experienced life in completely different ways. So why exactly would you teach me the same way that you were taught? Slowly but surely, more people like me are breaking into the tech industry, and it's causing the makeup of our industry to change. And as our industry changes, we need to be able to change with it. And that means changing the way in which we mentor. Mentors must be willing to adapt and adjust to the uniqueness that comes with mentoring someone who is a minority. Making ourselves aware of the challenges that, minor that minorities face in tech on a daily basis and the challenges you may face when mentoring them. One of the challenges our industry is currently faced with is, <clears throat> currently faced with is figuring out employee retention. Before we look at retention, we're gonna take a look at the current employment numbers for five of the biggest software development co uh, uh, companies in the industry currently. Industries such as, or companies such as Intel, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. Uh, so take a, let's take a look at the numbers for people who identify as male, people who identify as female, white, black, Hispanic, and other. And as you can see, these numbers are pretty alarming. <clears throat> and if we look at how likely you are to keep your job given the possibility that, say, you're a dual minority, for example, if you're white, you're just below 4% likely to quit your job. Black and Hispanic is just below 5%. And what happens if you are an actual dual minority? Say you're an African American woman, for example, or a Hispanic American woman. If you're an African American woman in corporate America, you're 61.29% greater, you have a 61.9% greater chance to quit your job than someone who is a white guy or a Hispanic American woman's 67.5% greater chance. And why is this? 
This is a question that was proposed to the CEO of Intel, a company who's been one of the forefront leaders on being public with their numbers on diversity and making an effort to improve, the, to improve diversity and culture within their company. However, they too have had an issue with retaining African American employees as well. The VP of Intel had this to say in regards to their inability to retain minority employees. He said he thinks Africans get, African Americans get frustrated that they're, that they're not progressing faster. They aren't meeting with and being sponsored by the senior executives at the company. According to research, whites and minorities do not progress up the corporate ladder at the same pace. Whites are more likely to be placed on a fast track to executive positions within their company, whereas people of color became executives much later in their careers at the same companies. Minorities more often than not plateaued in their careers and got stuck in middle management, and as a result, many would leave their respective companies. This creates a domino effect for newer employees. This leaves no minority employees for newer employees to look up to. And when researching other potential places of employment, I personally ask myself, how many people at this company look like me? How many people have built successful careers at this company look like me? And how many people have become executives at this company look like me? And it's far too often that the answer to that question is no one. And this can be disheartening to both junior and senior level employees. However, there are companies who manage to retain minorities and are able to see them succeed after the fact. So what sets them apart from the rest? How are some minorities breaking that upper management barrier at companies and being retained over time? What keeps me or any other minority, for that example, uh, for what keeps me or any other minority motivated to take advantage of greater opportunities within the tech industry? And in asking myself this question, I came across a study conducted on the career progression of whites versus minorities up the corporate ladder. One of the conclusions of the study found that whites are more likely to be placed on a fast track to executive positions, positions within their company. And as for people of color, they held middle, middle management positions much longer than their white colleagues. <clears throat> so whites would essentially be fast track, whereas people of color would plateau in their careers and get stuck in middle management. And while this was the case at these companies, whereas minorities were successful, while people of color weren't fast-tracked to these executive positions, their mentors invested in them as if they would be. Their mentors continued pouring into them, preparing them for breaking that upper management barrier. And in turn, this helped prevent lowering work performance and increased chances at employee retention. This is my first mentor, a guy by the name of Dave Moore. Dave mentored me individually for several months, and eventually Dave would introduce me to Malcolm as my co-mentor. And about four months into my apprenticeship, Dave introduced me to this guy, a guy by the name of Paul Pagel. And I remember a conversation Dave and I had. He said, Byron, do you know what Scope is in Ruby? And at the time, I was still pretty new to software development in general, and I was new to Ruby, so I said, no, I don't know what Scope is in Ruby. He said, awesome, because I set up a one-on-one -on -one with you and the CEO of the company. He's going to explain to you what scope is in Ruby. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, <laughs> like, like the CEO of the company is going like, to talk to me and explain to me software development? Like, that's crazy, All right? Um, you know, so, and with that, Dave also introduced me to a lot of other people at the company of 8th Light, people who I generally wouldn't have had the courage to introduce myself to in the first place. And with that, it helped build my courage up to introduce myself to people that were also outside of Eighth Light, and thus growing my network of mentors. So to be completely successful as mentors, we must be aware of the challenges that we may face when mentoring someone who is a minority. We're presented with challenges that just hasn't been the norm for our industry in previous years. And because of that, we need to adjust. According to research, minorities who plateaued in their careers received mentoring that was basically instructional, whereas the most successful minorities enjoyed closer, fuller, developmental relationships with their mentors. So purely instructional mentoring wasn't sufficient enough. Apprentices needed to feel connected to their mentors. Research shows that cross-race as well as cross-gender relationships can have difficulty forming. Nevertheless, mentorships must often be 
cross race or cross gender. And as a result, you have the possibility of situations such as negative stereotypes. Mentors must be willing to give their apprentices the benefit of the doubt, investing in them because we expect them to succeed. A potential mentor who withholds the a potential mentor who holds a negative stereotype, perhaps based on race, might withhold that support for his apprentice, his or her apprentice, until they've proven themselves worthy. Such subtle racism as that may help explain why none of the minority professionals in the research that I cited earlier were fast-tracked to executive positions. Whites were placed on a fast track based on their perceived potential whereas people of color had to display a proven and sustained record of solid performance over time. In effect, people of color had to be overprepared before they were placed on the executive track. And I don't know about you, but I start to get more reserved in my actions when I'm not given the benefit of the doubt. I start to take less chances and say a lot less out of that lack of trust. Negative stereotypes have also been proven to reduce work performance as well, which brings me to the topic of stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is when people feel themselves to be at risk of conforming to the stereotypes within their social group. And to elaborate on this, psychologists, psychologists at Stanford conducted a research study. They placed both men and women of equal level math skills in a room, and they gave them a standardized math test to take. And even though the men and the women were of equal level math skills, the women would actually underperform on these standardized math tests. And the psychologists just weren't sure exactly why this was. And eventually they had an epiphany. They said, they said perhaps what we're witnessing is the definition of stereotype threat. So they reconducted the study. They brought the men and women together in the room once again, gave them the standardized math tests, except this time they did something different. This time, before the test started, they stood up in front of the class and they said, you may have heard that women don't perform as well as men on standardized math tests. However, that's not true for this particular test. For this particular test, women actually do as well as the men. And with those few words, they helped eliminate the underperformance of the women on these standardized math tests. So just being in an environment where you believe there's a stereotype can affect how you perceive yourself. Sometimes all apprentices need to be told is that they can do something, to be told that they're as good as everyone else that's around them. And that brings us to another challenge that you may face when mentoring someone who is a minority, and that's being a coach and a counselor. A coach gives technical advice while a counselor talks about the emotional experience of doing something and offers that emotional support. And I remember when I had started my apprenticeship at 8th Light, I walked into work every day with one goal in mind, and that was to make sure that I didn't get fired. <laughs> all right, like you laugh, but that was like in my mind all the time, <laughs> right? Uh, like I was walking into work with this imposter syndrome. I was surrounded by people that went to school for computer science. I was surrounded by people that had been in the industry for five, 10 plus years, by people that just dropped 20 stacks on dev bootcamp, right? And I'm like completely new to software development. And over time, this started weighing down on me. And luckily, I had opened up to my mentors and I let them know how I felt. And to my surprise, my mentor expressed to me that he felt the same way when he had started his apprenticeship. He thought every day that when he walked into eighth light, he was also gonna get fired. And this was huge to me because I knew how much experience he had. I knew he had years of professional experience before becoming an apprentice. So I was like, all right, if he felt this way, then maybe I'm doing okay. And sure enough, my mentor is rest assured that my apprenticeship was going rather well. So to be completely effective as mentors, we must play the role of coach and counselor because too often minorities feel like outcasts because we feel as if there's no one at our companies to relate to. And while there may not be many people at the company that look like us, that doesn't mean that you as mentors can't be there to emotionally support your apprentices through the mentorship process. Research shows that apprentices are more likely to be retained when they felt as though they could look up to their mentors. Close mentoring relationships are much more likely to form when both parties see parts of themselves in the other person. 
the apprentice sees someone whom he wants to be like in the future, and the mentor sees someone who reminds himself or herself of themselves years ago. As I'd stated before, my mentor felt like he'd been in my shoes before. He felt like he wasn't good enough to work for 8th Light the same way I did. He thought he was going to get fired from 8th Light in the same way I did. We both went through similar struggles and feelings of emotion and connected on that level. As I mentioned before, many mentorships must be cross-race or cross-gender. And something that many cross-race relationships may suffer from is something known as protective hesitation. Protective hesitation is when you view your relationship with someone as more fragile than others in fear that you might offend that other person out of something that you do or say, out of fear that they may take it the wrong way. In a case study, a white mentor thought his African-American apprentice's style was too abrasive, but he kept, that, he kept that feeling to himself for fear of sounding prejudiced, specifically that he harbored the stereotype that all black men were rude or disrespectful. The mentor eventually found out that he was right when his apprentice's style became an issue with other people at the company as well. And at that point, his, apprentices, his apprentice had been deemed a problem, one that his mentor could have easily helped him solve had he had mentioned it earlier. And people believe that we aren't supposed to discuss race. If we have to discuss it, then it must be a problem. But relationships where apprentice and mentor can openly discuss race can translate into greater opportunities for the apprentice. Some might argue that having open discussions about race between mentors and apprentices might leave the apprentice feeling othered. But that doesn't have to be the case. When we are open to, to discussing race, we're helping inspire people like me to take hold of, things, of what makes them unique. Now, I remember a conversation that I had with one of my mentors. He said, Byron, I don't know if you realize not a lot of people in the software development industry look like you. And I was like, <laughs> OK, like, <laughs> like, is this guy making a point? And sure enough, he was. So he said, Byron, I don't know if you realize not a lot of people in the software development industry look like you. And because of that, if you want you can take your goals of wanting to actually give talks at conferences, to give workshops, to mentor more people, and you can be that person that people like yourself look up to. You can be that person that introduces more people like you into the software development, development industry. My mentor inspired me to take hold of something that other people might use to make them feel othered. By openly discussing race with me, and helping me to see an opportunity to inspire others like myself. So we discussed how white men as well as people of color have been shown not to progress up the corporate ladder at the same pace and how people of color tend to get stuck in middle management positions much longer than their white colleagues. We've also taken a look at the diversity numbers among several of the big tech name, big name tech companies and employee retention rates as well. We've learned that we can combat employer retention through building a strong network of mentors to support our minority apprentices. We've learned about being a coach and a counselor for our apprentices. We've learned about the possibilities of negative stereotypes within the workplace, as well as how we can identify and be role models for our apprentices. And we've also learned about the possibilities of protective hesitation. And I urge you to ask yourself this question. Where is the gap for minorities in tech and how can I help close it? While mentoring minorities closely and improving the way we, we mentor is a pretty huge opportunity, it simply is not the end all. There are plenty of other ways for us to improve diversity with, and culture within our workplace, but, but a huge opportunity area that we're missing is creating closer, fuller, developed mentor relationships with our apprentices. And growing our apprentices' network of mentors to help ensure that our apprentices, our, our apprentices succeed as well. If we work on that and we can continue to ask ourselves this question on a regular basis, I believe we'll see more people happy at our companies and be able to attract and retain a lot more diverse groups at our companies as well. And that's all I have for you today.
finished early, so I have time for questions if uh, anyone. Sweet. Uh, can you be a bit more specific when you say there's a larger cultural opposition? Like, are you saying that there are people within the teams not buying into the? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, right, right, for sure. Uh, so the question was. Uh, like in regards to increasing uh, diversity and improving culture within a workplace uh, on a much larger scale at larger companies. Uh, so in terms of that, honestly, it comes down to the upper management, right? Like if upper management truly believes that increasing diversity and, <clears throat> and inclusion within a company is important, then they'll make those changes and essentially get everyone else on board. And if people aren't on board, then perhaps they don't belong at these companies. Like, and that's honestly the harsh truth. Uh, like, not, and it's like picking a technology at a software develop, like with any in any team, right? Uh, not everyone is going to agree with the software that you decide to pick, right? And perhaps, like, if like whoever decides, hey, that software isn't the software for me. Maybe they don't belong on that team. And that is the honest, harsh truth uh, to increasing diversity and inclusion. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, to help with imposter syndrome, well, first off, right, like I had to have the ability to be open to them and uh, I didn't really develop that ability to like be open to them and admit that I had those thoughts until they like opened up to me first, uh, right? So like opening up that dialogue and essentially like admitting that, hey, we weren't perfect when we started out, uh, right? Like I didn't know any of the stuff that, you know, you don't know currently. Um, and just reminding them of that on a regular basis, right? Uh, so that, like, because on the outside looking in, uh, when someone's a beginner, they're looking at us like we're wizards. They're just like, oh man, like you're, <laughs> like this is magic that you're doing right now, you know? And we have to like keep reminding them that it's not and that they can actually get there someday. Uh, but to help with uh, imposter syndrome, another thing that uh, helped me is actually teaching people that knew less than I did. Um, right, so uh, one uh, cool thing uh, within the culture of my company is that they would assign us to give talks, uh, right, like uh, talks on like scope or uh, like any other technical topic uh, for that matter. Um, and whether people actually knew about it or not, or like you help a couple of people understand something a bit more in detail, right, it like gave me that time to focus and hone in on this one thing that I could help teach someone. So that was really helpful to me. Uh, I have, I have, uh, uh, the question was, have I taken on an apprentice? Uh, I've taken on uh, two or three. Um, our first apprentice that I took on, she's actually in this room. It was a really bad experience. <laughs> 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 like, I was really bad at giving feedback. I completely forgot how like, like detrimental that was to the apprenticeship process and how like fragile we are uh, when actually uh, given that feedback. So uh, like she had like opened up to me and like expressed that. Uh, and because of that, that helped me become a better mentor. And uh, she's one of my best friends right now. So that's also cool. <laughs> what does eighth light mean? Uh, what does eighth light mean? That is a good question. And I will answer that for you later. <laughs> because <laughs> no, so uh, eighth light, uh, from what I can recall, and this is probably wrong, but it's on the website. Um, there are seven lights within the ideal, the ideals of what we believe uh, goes into writing clean code and software. 
and the eighth light is actually supposed to be you, right? It's supposed to be, uh, you're essentially uh, like the most important piece of writing, so uh, writing clean code and writing good software. Um, uh, in the black shirt, I got you next. <laughs> Uh, for people who, uh, whose companies don't have actual mentorship programs, uh, what avenues should they take? Honestly, uh, just start mentoring. What are they going to tell you? No. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, and if they do tell you no, then hey, it, like, I, like, that's another situation where it's, hey, this might not be the place for me. Um, right? Like, uh, I'd honestly like, start that. And uh, if you have like, someone that's more junior come up to you to say, hey, like I'm more interested in learning about X, Y, Z, uh, and you can like go from there, um, or uh, you could take it upon yourself to like just say, hey, if anyone wants to learn about this list of things, then come to me and like let's have some one-on-one -on -one sessions and start uh, going from there, and it could potentially grow into something that's a bit more formal uh, and official within the company. So I've seen it happen before. Uh, back there. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was uh, pretty lengthy, uh, so I'll try to summarize it. Um, the question was, uh, like with me getting my first computer and that being important to me, uh, do I think that there are ways of which we can improve uh, the ways in which people uh, like me when I was a kid to get technology in their hands, such as Raspberry Pi, uh, et cetera? And, uh, and yeah, like we can be very proactive on that because it's honestly very important. While I didn't touch upon it in this talk, there are a lot of kids that grow up without computers. Uh, but now, nowadays, there are more computers in a lot of households, but there's still a lot of kids that don't have them. So having like a cheap computer, whereas people can like do some experimenting with and uh, figure things out is really huge to a lot of people's lives. Uh, and it's just like this area in which of technology that a lot of people that I know uh, from uh, that when I grew up, uh, simply don't know exists, right? Uh, when I became a software developer, people were like, cool, like what's that, uh, right? Like it's completely new, so it's really huge. Yeah, so the question was, how did I connect with Mentor, and, uh, or how did I connect with my Mentor? Uh, so yeah, so like Dave, uh, he had told me like a couple of times during my apprenticeship that uh, he saw a lot of traits that were in him that was in me uh, during uh, my apprenticeship. For one, I would not take no for an answer. Um, like <laughs> I would continuously hound him on things, uh, and because I was working full-time at Best Buy, uh, I had to, like, still, uh, on days before I became an apprentice full time, I was coming in there, like, every day that I had off and, like, asking him to stay with me, like, extra hours if he could. Um, so he, like, saw traits in, in me that he saw in himself. And I think that's honestly the most important part of creating a, a mentorship or mentor relationship is actually being able to identify with the person that you're mentoring, right? Uh, without that, there will always be a disconnect, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. I, was, I think I was asking more along the like, okay, so say we, we have a, someone like, a, like you were, mm -hmm. who wants to connect with the mentor but doesn't have a date like, right there. Mm -hmm. How do we find them a date? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. How do you find people without mentors, mentors? Uh, that is a, a bit more difficult question, but uh, one of the ideas of which I have is. Uh, creating a meetup, uh, specifically I'm planning to create one for people of color 
And this meetup is actually going to be like a travel meetup, whereas uh, we go to these neighborhoods where uh, there's a larger population of people of color and actually have like meetups at a coffee shop, et cetera, right? Uh, because like I said, I had no clue software uh, meetups were a thing uh, until he had introduced me to them. Uh, and they, they weren't in my neighborhood, right? Like they weren't <laughs> like anywhere near where I was growing up. Uh, so I think that is the most vital uh, thing is like putting people like within the vicinity of having people that they can meet with and talk to on a regular basis. Hmm? Most high school counselors don't know how to give the right advice to kids and expose them to the different opportunities uh, that are there in tech. Hmm? How do we close that gap? Have, have any ideas on yeah. kids who may not be exposed to it at home? Yeah, so the question was how do high school counselors like close the gap for uh, kids uh, to essentially get them interested in tech? Yeah, so um, sorry, but like any experience that I've had in school in terms of like tech was like way behind all the time, right? Uh, and it was like bad experiences where I, at one point I was like, is this what I really wanna do? Um, so with that, I would honestly outsource and find someone who is actually in the uh, like tech industry um, and like say like, hey, like this is our curriculum, this is what we're doing. Is this even relevant, right? Uh, right? Or is it like five, 10 years old? Uh, and from there, uh, you can create uh, something that is a bit more up to date, as well as creating something that's a bit more interactive and fun, because like, while like, learning about technology is cool and all, like, that's not the part that's actually the fun part. The fun part is doing, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, and doing things, and like, uh, doing things that are interactive, such as like, maybe playing with uh, like a toy robot and like, coding that, right? Um, there's uh, different like, toy, uh, coding toys of which I can like give you links to if you want. Um, but yeah. Cool. Uh, so I had a mentor for a mentee for a few months back, sorry, apprentice, mm -hmm. for a few weeks. Um, how would you recommend, like, what's the first step uh, for taking a relationship from an informative one to one that's closer to coaching and counseling? Uh, so, how do you transition from being a more uh, informative mentor to becoming a coaching counselor? Uh, yeah, so like that goes to what I was uh, mentioning earlier, and that's essentially um, just like being open to them, right? Because uh, like in a a lot of mentor a lot of mentorships actually begin that way, whereas uh, you're just being the informative mentor, and you're actually not connecting on that level. Uh, to the point that they will open up to you with like things that they don't know, for example, right? Um, so just being open and honest with them uh, on some of your faults uh, that you like currently have or have had in the past, uh, and just letting them like reminding them that you don't know everything, that you didn't know everything once upon a time, um, and letting them know like, hey, if like there's anything that you want to like come to me with, like feel free, um, and like I feel like that can help bridge the gap there. So. Uh, can you repeat that last part? What advice would I give? For someone like myself who like kind of broke into the industry on their own, without formal education around it, or even mentors, or even like in my career going like, I've got to help out other people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, can we talk after? Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty long one. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyone else? What are the don'ts for mentors? <laughs> Mentor. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if I, if I had a larger time block, I actually wanted to touch upon that. Um, but the don'ts for mentors in terms of mentoring minorities or mentoring in general? Yeah, both. Both? Okay, cool. Uh, so one of the things of which I actually use as inspiration for this talk, uh, as I said, uh, my mentor inspired me to like get on stage and like give talks, uh, right? Like, 
not all minorities want to do that. <laughs> not all, like, right, like not all people of color want to actually be on stage and give talks and workshops. Some of us just want to be regular developers, right? Um, so like you can still inspire them to be that and do what they actually want to do uh, without like telling them, hey, go up and get into the spotlight and be that person that everyone looks up to. Uh, right, um, like it's fortunate uh, or un unfortunate uh, for me that this is something that I actually want to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, one of the don'ts that I would say for mentoring someone who is a minority. Uh, for more, I can uh, talk to you afterwards because it'd be a long list. <laughs> Yeah, it all, it all, so like the question was uh, like where do you as a mentor draw the line for when someone says uh, that they can or can't do something and telling them that they can actually do it? Uh, well, it like honestly, when you know their ability, if you're working with them closely as a mentor, then you know like where they're at uh, and essentially like what they can do. Um, and if like you tell them, hey, like you can definitely do this and they fail, then that's fine too, right? Like. Uh, we're, we're all learning from failure and like you just rest assure them that it's all good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like most of the time, like just being said, like, like just the words of saying like, hey, like you got this is huge. And that completely changes how a lot of people think about things, so. Uh, how much time? One, one more question? Okay, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so, it, uh, what was that? Yep, cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to find me. I'm always open to discussing whatever. It doesn't have to be mentoring, it can be you know, anything. Uh, cool. Thanks for coming to my talk.